ஹலோ ஹலோ முதிதா ஹலோ ஆதித்யா ஹாய் யா சோ லெட் மீ இன்ட்ரோ듀ஸ் யூ வாட் கிதாபே கிளப் இஸ் சோ கிதாபே கிளப் இஸ் a women's only club operating in several cities across india and uh, we do a lot of uh, bookish events book recommendations and uh, offline and online events uh, to enhance the reading culture in our country and and we 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 will be celebrating our third year anniversary in the next month in some three glorious years and coming to uh, the authors from mythanama today with us we have mudita so for 25 years mudita has edited best selling books and aditya has crafted mind boggling questions together they have hosted nearly 5000 quiz shows across the world that's an amazing number and uh, after authoring textbooks and quiz books they now plan to write more books for young people like you and mythonama is just the beginning so a very warm welcome mudita and aditya and it is amazing to see the number of quizzes you quiz shows you guys have done together that's wonderful we are lucky i guess doing <laughs> what, uh, i mean i personally love to do i know that uh, mudita is also entranced by the whole concept of getting people to know more and to think more so that is uh, one of the drivers that uh, pushes us to constantly do things great so uh, coming to what mythanama is so mythanama celebrates india's cultural diversity by bringing alive fascinating legends from many faiths uh, buddhism islam christianity judaism jainism zoroastrianism hinduism sikhism as well as tribal and folklore it is a tapestry of tales in which are woven life lessons that's actually very very important as well fables fuel imaginations with stories of gigantic birds shape shifting beings uh, amazing creatures with people with 10 heads or 1000 arms flying horses talking trees so mythanama also features games puzzles and immersive activities for deeper engagement so this is actually wonderful i think this, these are the things which uh, which really fascinate all the children to know about a person with 10 heads thousand arms and flying horses and if you have quizzes and puzzles along with the legends i mean the books and all the stories then uh, it's like an icing on the cake <laughs> yeah the i mean the idea is that uh, it you know now nowadays we we are living in an age of technology and digital uh, you know immersion so a lot of people think that books are outdated but well of course they are not and we love books and we continue to you know sort of promote them but we also thought of how we could make them as interactive as possible within the format of a book so if you are reading and also you are sort of constantly thinking because you then have to answer some questions or you know it's making you go to another medium or a website or a, or a parent or a grandparent to know more about that then we think that that is what the book wants to do it wants to catalyze you it wants to make you think and makes you you know not just absorb and not just read but also uh, interact with the book okay so i'm um, just one thing uh, can we neha could we possibly see the people that we are uh, talking to it would be nice if uh, if we can see the bachas and their parents sure um uh... in uh sure i think uh, if you guys yeah, if can you uh, switch on your videos that would be great it's nice to put uh, at least faces to some names <laughs> true yeah it's always nice to talk to people rather than uh, to black postage stamps <laughs> or labels we hate labeling people you know as as an individual to stick a label onto someone without really knowing that person is uh, uh, uh not right in my I agree. so i agree we'd love to see the people around us especially children because you know there's something in the eyes in that expression when you talk to kids 
you look at them, there are questions that are just bubbling out from them. And yeah. uh, that curiosity is uh, something that is wonderful. And we tend to lose that as we grow older. We, after an age, you know, when kids become teenagers, they think they know everything. And uh, when they get into college, they're damn sure they know everything. So it's only when you become old and uh, start losing your teeth and your hair that you realize, hey, there is so much I don't know. <laughs> and uh, that's when you realize that uh, the world is so big, so much bigger than any of us. Right. So okay, guys, uh... kids, please turn on your cameras. Let's see you. I think uh, one of the parents just messaged me Oh. Saying that since the recording is on, she's not comfortable showing her kid. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. That's that's fair enough. Okay, so then we can we can just talk and uh, hopefully we'll hear them if not see them. Definitely. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go. All right. Uh, so one of the one of the questions that was asked by Aditi's child and Aditi also that Maithanama is not a word from dictionary. So how did you coin that word? Okay, that's, uh, that's a nice, uh, good question to start with. Thank you, Aditi and uh, child. <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, I guess Maithonama really, uh, um, it encapsulates what we want to do with this book. Uh, first of all, of course, the type of a book has to be attractive, should be. Uh, I mean, we've been told never judge a book by its cover, but uh, more often than not, we saw we see that beautiful covers do help, you know, uh, get the book out into um, public sort of awareness. So we wanted a catchy name. Uh, we wanted a name that uh, would immediately tell you that it's about mythologies. So the mytho part of it comes from there. Um, the second part, Nama, the word, is um, actually Persian in its origin. And uh, I would say that in, in, in the Persian, it would mean, uh, it could mean story, uh, it could mean uh, history, it could also mean an epic. So, the, you know, for instance, uh, you, some people that study history and the children that will grow, will grow up to read about it, um, there are many uh, stories and books and tales written like the Bacha Nama or the Razma Nama the Akbar Nama. So these are basically stories of a person or the stories about a place, etc. So we wanted to bring in this uh, concept of, uh, of, of the fact that they're legends. And it's, it's like an epic journey that we are going on into the mythologies of India. And also, more importantly, most importantly, the subtle message was, is that um, India, our country is a country of numerous uh, faiths and therefore numerous mythologies. So we should we should try and reflect that within at least the title, and then you know sort of pull people into reading it and hopefully absorbing that I that idea that there is a lot happening. So it's not just one particular faith or mythology, but uh, um, you know a blend and amalgamation of of many things. So so that's what pushed us to, um, you know, pick this name. And of course, we had help from our marketing and editorial with kids at Penguin who told us what would work, what would not work. But ultimately, this is it. And uh, we hope you like it. Yes, of course. Maithanama is really a very catchy uh, name. And like you suggested, how uh, you came to you, you how, how it was coined. So Aditi, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for sending us that question. Uh, just you. one, uh, just one point I'd uh, like to bring up here. It's uh, more of an observation. Madhita mentioned uh, Razm Nama in the list of Namas. Razm mm -hmm. Nama was actually a translation into Persian of the Mahabharat, which okay. was done during Mughal time, so that Akbar. more Akbar people Shai. and the people at uh, who were not familiar with the Sanskritic epics would be able to access it. So. Again, the effort was to make these stories more accessible to people, right? So Mahabharat, the word Razm literally means war or conflict or battle. And Nama again means the story. So it means the story of the battle, of the great battle. So it's been going on for a long time. The effort to get more and more people to read. 
Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Now a question uh, about what you've been doing. Like I told, I'm fascinated by the number 5,000 quiz shows. So you guys are quiz masters. What inspired you to write the book? And especially about Indian mythology. Okay. Uh, that's a very difficult question to answer in such a short time. I mean, uh, yes, we've done a huge number of quizzes. Uh, it started off even earlier because uh, uh, I used to quiz myself. I still do whenever I get the time and I really feel like it. So uh, it's been a journey of exploration for me personally. And as a company, we set up an organization and we, then we did all these programs. The driver, as I said, was uh, the inspiration to do something, to get children to know more, to get children to ask more questions. So the bulk of our uh, programs and quizzes that we've done is with children, school children, because we want them through answering questions and asking questions to get to know more and uh, thereby you know, enhance their own experiences, enhance their own personalities and grow as individuals. So that was the purpose behind doing a lot of quizzes. And um, once we figured out that uh, there is a lot more to this world than what we see on a daily basis, we started <laughs> making the quizzes larger and bigger. And uh, that's essentially why we do it. We want people to know more. We want people to uh, experience a little more. And the purpose behind knowing more is not just that I have this information and that's the end of it. It's to apply that knowledge. You apply that uh, information, it becomes knowledge. It becomes part of how you behave with other people. If I know more about someone else, I start appreciating that person more. I start uh, understanding that other person more. So then slowly, that person knows more about me, I know more about them. And we come closer together. So it strengthens the bonds of humanity, simply knowing more about each other. Because it's to our mind, it's ignorance that leads to a lot of misunderstandings, it leads to a lot of contempt, it leads to a lot of conflict. As soon as you start peeling away that those layers or the veils of darkness that shroud that core of ignorance, you start uh, finding new facets, you find new things about other people that you never knew before. So it makes us better people, we feel, and it allows us to see other people as better people. Okay, so uh, I think that is one of the probably the biggest reason behind why we do quizzes, why we wanted to write books about uh, quizzing and about information and knowledge uh, and help other people know more. Anything uh, you would like to add, Odita? I think the question also uh, sort of included the fact why, uh, on why we chose this particular subject. So okay. you might want to talk yeah. a little bit about that. Uh, why mythology? Okay, sorry, second part of the question. Why a book on mythology? Uh, you see, mythology is stories, right? In essence, uh, if we say something is mythical, it's legendary, it is not always borne out by historical fact. It's not something that you can prove happened or existed or uh, someone something grew there. Sometimes they're just wonderful stories. So you have these stories about these amazingly large trees that are so big that a man on a horse could ride for a hundred years and still not go around. You have uh, the trees have fruit or, that are so big that one single, it, they grow like bunches of grapes, let's say, and one grape can feed an entire village for a year. I mean, you can't even imagine the scale of such things. So what happens when you see something really large? It's legendary. We talk about legends today, legends in sports, legends in other fields. So these legends over time became bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, it's uh, one of the theories that during, there are four stages of the world or creation in each uh, Mahayoga in uh, Hinduism. 
there's the krita yoga the, the kreta yoga the dwapar yoga and the kalyog we are in kalyog right now so in kalyog may people are about 6 feet tall in the dwapar yoga they were about 8 feet tall in the treta yoga at the time of ram people were about 13 to 14 feet tall and in the krita yoga at the time of, uh, of uh, probably vaman who was considered a dwarf but the common person was actually over 20 feet tall now so the people have diminished now this is not to say that physically we became smaller quite the opposite in many ways uh, but it is probably how people or humanity has diminished over the years and kalyug is supposed to be the worst of humanity so we are actually becoming worse so the human human scale is reducing the interaction with people is reducing so these are like legends and the stories that grew over time now all of these have some meaning they have a lesson that helps us improve ourselves in life when we talk about how the ravan had 10 heads maybe he didn't actually have 10 heads right today someone uh, if your child comes home and tells you that you know today i saw a man with 10 heads you tell the child hey stop it like jhoot mat bolo aise nahi hota hai to ravan kaise tha how did ravan have 10 heads maybe those were 10 facets of his personality that came around maybe he had multiple personality disorder there are various theories about it so uh, that's how legends grew but each of those personalities or each of those heads signified something and uh, uh, similarly you have someone who is considered to be hanuman could grow become small maybe he could maybe he couldn't but again the fact of the matter is that there was a story there was a purpose behind his ability to grow huge and a purpose behind his ability to become small similarly all these mythological stories have purposes to help people become better to help them lead better lives so we felt it's important that children today don't forget them you know in the day of uh, the marvel comics and dc comics and uh, playstations and pokemons children shouldn't forget about uh, the the burak and uh, the jatak stories or the panchatantra and stories like this which are all part of our own culture our legends and uh, they need to be reminded and if we can do it in a way that's fun that's engaging that encourages them to want to know even more about it after reading the book hopefully they'll say okay uh, but there must be more because you know you've talked about this you may have but there's something else obviously so let them find out more i'm not saying that they have to come to us every time but it encourages them to learn more to know more so uh, mythology is very much a part of our heritage it's a part of our tradition and we wanted them to know the plurality of india india they say you know uh, it's a land of great diversity we have unity in diversity so as one nation we have many different people many different cultures we are like a mini world in itself when I mean, people from one part of the country don't understand people from another part of the country when they speak in their own languages similarly they wear different clothes they have different climates like right now we are in the north of india we are in delhi it's 44 or 45 degrees temperature outside down in uh, bangalore it's 26 degrees in dehradun which is just 200 kilometers away it's about the same it's about 27 28 degrees so the climate is different in different parts of the country the languages are different food is different what we wear is different and our stories also become different so we have to understand that one area story may be completely different from another area story so read about all of them find out more understand each other more and thereby come closer have i said oh, I... have i said a lot <laughs> no but what you said actually uh, makes a lot of sense we uh, and you know why we need to read these uh, read these mythological stories is important 
I'll just stray away from what I was asking towards the beginning. Uh, Aditya, you said that um, you used to question yourself. You used to quiz yourself. I would like to know more about that. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, that's uh, maybe it came across like that. I used to quiz. I was a quizzer or a person who used to take part in quiz contests. Okay, okay. In school. So it's been what uh, 1978 I started. So it's been 44 years now that I have been taking part in quizzes myself. So it's been a journey of discovery for me, right from the first uh, question and answer session that I had, which my grandmother introduced me to, apart from stories that she told me about uh, Hanuman and uh, Sheikh Chilli and Jumman and uh, Mirza Nasruddin and Mullah Nasruddin, she also told, uh, started asking me questions about general knowledge, as it was called. So my GK improved. I became inquisitive by nature. I couldn't stop until I'd read like a lot around the subject. Of course, sometimes it meant that my academic subject, so let's say science, if I'm studying about it, I would go off at a tangent, find out 10 different things, none of which were really useful for me in my answering at that time. But that was also because, you know, in a school syllabus based test, you need to give that particular point as the answer. If you write five other things, the teacher is probably going to cut marks for saying, okay, this boy doesn't really know very much. He's writing a lot of stuff around it to disguise that fact. Maybe I lost marks because of that. But uh, definitely it made me uh, find out a lot more things about it. And possibly as a concept, you get to know your academic subjects better if you can read around what your school textbook tells you. So yeah, we would like children to read more. And uh, that's what I meant when I said I was a quizzer myself. I used to quiz myself, not that I kept asking myself questions, <laughs> which I still do. I mean, all of us do that at some point of time or the other, but uh, sure. we always don't have the answers. But uh, yeah. I used to so I take part in quizzes. Aditya, you touched upon a very important thing, which um, all the parents here will agree, that we need to make our kids more inquisitive by asking them questions. And that really helps, maybe not academically, but otherwise to, be, uh, to, you know, uh, to improve their personalities, to improve the person they are. So yes, that's, I think, a very great insight that you have given us. And coming to the next question, uh, Ruchi Kala had asked us, that uh, she's a mother to an eight-year-old uh, child. Uh, they are avid readers. Uh, she reads a lot to her kid, but uh, she has never read any mythological stories to her kid. And her question is very specific to that. So she asks that you know the current generation. Uh, how do you how do you relate those stories in the current times to, uh, to the generation? So like she is not able to relate. Uh, any of the stories to her eight-year-old child that you know how I relate it to the current times her daughter maybe asks her questions which she's not able to answer so Mudita how do we do that um, I think that's in a very interesting question which obviously comes from a very uh, from a person a parent that's thinking a lot about their parenting um, I would say Ruchi thank you for the question um, uh, so, as Aditya said, mythology is an ocean, really, of um, stories that are as fantastic as, uh, you know, they can possibly be, but also at the core, at their core, extremely um, rooted in what life is all about or what life should be. And if we really look, there are, there are answers to many questions. There are also life lessons inside a lot of the legends because they've obviously grown out of the need to explain something to someone somewhere. So if uh, Ruchi and other people are struggling with this, um, I think it's important to uh, definitely filter, uh, you know, the amount of information that is out there and see what applies really to whatever is age appropriate, whatever is, you know, region appropriate, language appropriate, etc. And this is something that we try to do in the book. When you, whoever does read the book will realize that, uh, you know, it's not just the story, let's say, of a 10-headed person or a 10-headed beast or a, or a flying horse. But that story is linked somehow to uh, something that a child may need in their everyday life. For instance, 
um, what are the issues that face, that challenge the children and therefore challenge the parents these days? There is the question of, uh, we are in technology, there's a question of cyber safety or, or generally safety. Uh, there's a question of um, bullying in schools, um, body shaming, um, integrity. How honest are you? You know, when they say like, what are you doing when nobody's watching? How honest are you? How truthful are you? Are you a good student? Good meaning, not marks wise good, but are you dedicated? Are you sincere? Are you a, are you a person that's living life uh, in a good way? Are you looking after your animals? Are you looking after plants around you? All these questions, really, there are links and there are stories and there are anecdotes in our mythologies. And in Mythonama, we have tried to pull in some of these, which apply to the age group that it is meant for. But also, obviously, it, it has to be a discussion between the children and the parents together. That's when it really, you know, really gets understood by the child because like i said just reading something is not enough you you need to understand how it applies you know to your uh, to your life so actually we have we have we chose one slide that we wanted to show and i think that this it fits in here perfectly so uh, if adit adit you can share the slide i have a little uh, sort of a little question for everyone um yeah the next one <coughs> Okay, so uh, I hope everyone can see this illustration. Yes, uh, yeah, it's visible. Uh, yeah, I hope everyone can. So now here, I I'm going to just let you absorb it for a, you know, a few seconds um, because it's quite amazing, <laughs> the idea. So if, so can anyone just, would anyone like to talk about it? Anyone in the audience? Just, just what, what is this thing? I mean, it's obviously a creature, but it's not a creature that one has seen. So uh, would anyone like to sort of, give their thoughts on what this could be? Aditi, would you like to share your thoughts? Uh, yes, of course. It feels like it's uh, multiple creatures are there within. There's a lion, a deer. Yeah, okay, 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 okay one second. So, actually, <laughs> you, you are answering my next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. It's it's a it's like a multi creature. It's like a creature which is obviously made up of many creatures, and you can see the see some of them. But what I was really hoping was for was if we can together identify some of these creatures, and then we un we'll come to the story behind it. So, Adit, you want to? Could you move to the next slide? Uh, yeah. So we um, labeled the different parts of this creature. This creature is called Navagunjara. It's the Navagunjara and it comes from a specific uh, Mahabharat, which is the Odia Mahabharat written in the 15th century uh, by a poet called Saral Das. So he, from whatever he would have read or you know understood and imagined of that time, has created this um, uh, Maha uh, Avatar, a Virat Roop of um of a particular god right so uh let's begin at number one right on top can anyone guess what that creature is uh specifically it's the orange um you know orange part frill let's say uh, frill yeah <laughs> that's nice okay you confused me there <laughs> i was thinking about the neck yeah and then you said you okay? We can start with the neck, which which is number two. Okay, that's peacock. Correct. Okay, Aditi correct. has given an answer. Yes, Aditi. So the number one is the cock or the rooster with the kalgi on its on its head. Great. So we got one and two. Uh, anyone for three? We you can send your answers by chat if you feel like it. 
that's uh, that's quite okay three is a bull aditi is on a roll here aditi why do you say that ah uh, because of the hum hum pad the pad yeah correct so so sometimes some children say that it might be a camel but yeah i mean it could be and uh, we would like children to imagine that too but in in this particular episode that's narrated it is a bull and it sort of a uh, representative of nandi which is shiv's vahan okay great so we've got that four is pretty simple i just wanted to comment uh, yeah. the background also when you give the context of the creation or the imagination of the creature that you see here it's by an odia poet odisha uh, would not odias even in the 15th 14th 13th century would not have seen very many camels yeah so they would have seen however cows bulls buffaloes so the chances of it being a camel are much lower chances of it being a bull are much higher and i think aditi you uh, subconsciously brought that uh, little bit of information into your mind and your brain has helped you identify the correct animal using that without you actively knowing that you're doing so and that's another aspect of quizzing it is what my thought process basically was as we are talking about mythology and then these animals somewhere relate to the god and goddesses so with that hump at the back it's definitely nandi the bull which Correct. is so uh, for brilliant. shiva brilliant so that's another way another bit of uh, information that is stored away in your brain and without like i said without you actively trying to think about it your brain has given you the right answer okay that's how the quizzing helps in connecting bits of information together and that's why we uh, try and use quizzing to help children learn how to learn better okay great so we got three four um see looks quite quite uh, recognizable right oh i see a little baby hi yes so what could number 4 be little one riyansh would you like to answer riyansh kya lag raha hai number 4 so this this um, green uh, which is the tail of this fantastic creature is a is a serpent or a snake right and it's sort of turned around and it's trying to read whatever this 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 creature is reading okay let's go so five number five is actually not very easy to distinguish but maybe somebody can try because of the coloration um yes yeah, aditi yeah. it, it is a lion <laughs> tell us how you got that <laughs> the color difference and again the mythology connect so lion is also a part in the mythology hmm vahan of durga yes the yes. vahan of durga correct and uh, number 6 is another big big cat tiger, tiger. this yeah, yeah. Fairly, I think it's probably one of the most recognizable. Um, then we come to number seven, which is the other leg, which is extended. That's a deer. Uh, I a deer. Yes. Correct. Correct. It's a deer. A deer, antelope, whatever. Then we go to number eight, which is sort of like uh, you know, sort of embellished. Uh, I don't think in real life it has those amazing ornamentations. But uh, what do you think that is? You can also see a bit of a nail at the bottom to give That's you an, an idea elephant. it's an elephant yes it is an elephant it's gray colored and it's thick right it's like a it's a it's the four leg of an elephant and then coming to number 9 should be fairly simple that's a human number... hand but i think that's the goddess or well, it could be why do you think so uh because there is henna on the hand so usually okay. henna is connected to a female what happened i think oh okay yeah well 
I mean, but you know, this is the age of gender neutrality. So we are not, uh, we're okay with whoever wants to wear henna. But okay. yeah, it's human, definitely. It's a human yeah. hand. And the human hand is, is reading my thunam, of course. <laughs> so now, why we wanted you to see this is that this is actually, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a root that uh, in the mouth of this creature, you see a lotus. It's a lotus and the lotus is for in Hindu mythology representative of Vishnu mm -hmm. or Krishna. And so, uh, so here, this is actually an episode that is represented, an episode from the Mahabharat where Arjun is in the forest and uh, he is on the verge of actually destroying a forest called Khandaprast. When uh, Krishna decides to, uh, you know, appear in this amazing form made up of nine different animals. And it's a big, fantastic, uh, amazing, incredible, never seen before, uh, you know, uh, uh, chimera that sort of stands up in front of Arjun and Arjun immediately stops. And so we, we this is one of the episodes we, where I'm trying to link back to the question that why we should read mythology, what is coming to us from mythology. If what we lost sound, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what happened to my. Uh, am I uh, audible? Yes. Yeah, you are. Now not. Hi, can you guys hear me? We no. can hear you, Mudita, but we're not able to see you. Yeah, now you're listening. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Okay, I don't know. I some break in the Wi-Fi. So um, I, I was saying that this. I I, I avoid, was I audible when I said uh, when I said the part about the appearance of Krishna in this avatar. Yes. Uh, to Arjun. Yes. Adit, why don't you take over? I think my internet is giving some issues. Okay, so basically, uh, this is this appears in that part of the Mahabharat where Arjun is about to destroy the Khandav one and burn it all so that Agni can feed off it. In some cases, in other cases, Arjun destroys the entire space so that the Pandavas can then build their capital there. But suddenly, this amazing creature appears in front of him and Arjun takes one look at it and says this cannot be any real animal it has to be divine because it has so many different features in it so many different animals combined or conjoined to make one fantastic beast then he sees the lotus and for him the lotus symbolizes Vishnu so he says this is a manifestation or this is an avatar or a Maharup or a Vishwarup of all animals. And why it is necessary to know about it now is to understand the intricate linkage between all animals. You know that every animal has their own place in the ecosystem. So the tiger keeps the population of deer, and other uh, grass eating or foliage eating animals in check in its area. Those guys keep uh, the plants in check. Those guys uh, provide manure for the plants to grow as well. So every creature, whether it's an ant or a beetle or a spider or a fly or a bird or a bigger bird or an eagle or um, a lion or a tiger or a deer or a, even a pig has its own place in the natural ecosystem. And if you destroy these animals, you're going to destroy everything. You're going to destroy the world. So to bring the whole concept of environmental degradation, we felt it was necessary for children to know about this aspect. So linking the Navagunjara which shows the divinity of animals and their role in the entire uh, natural world. Why it's important to man? Because we are in a symbiotic or a 
you know, an equitable relationship with nature. If nature suffers, we will suffer. And nowhere do you see that happening more than wherever there is degradation, you have, where people have deforested mountains, there are landslides, the rivers are in spate. Where uh, people have destroyed forest cover, uh, there are deserts forming, the temperatures are going up, there's global warming. All these are issues that children should know, know today. And these are also issues that probably concerned people thousand years ago or two thousand years ago or even earlier and that is why they came up with stories like this and furthering the whole concept of why children should read mythology it's because they can find parallels in today's world does that wow, sound that, that wonderfully answers the question so actually i have also been reading uh, my son has also been reading mythology and uh, but yeah this this uh, kind of you know you have changed the way the things should be so i'm going to be more mindful when we are reading it together so thank you so much for Great. this uh, just one more point i wanted to the uh, bring out now uh, and it's purely because hum hindustani hai so today kids are immersed or uh, have been immersed for the past decade or a little more than that in worlds like Harry Potter, in uh, Rick Riordan's uh, theory, uh, you know, his stories of Greek uh, gods and Magnus Chase and Cain Chronicles. So all over the world, and kids are reading about all those mythologies, albeit in a different way. We want them to know that, hey, Indian culture is rich with such characters. We have our own superheroes. We have maybe the proto superheroes, someone like Hanuman, who could, uh, you know, leap over the whole ocean in one single jump, who could become a hundred or a thousand feet tall and become as small as an ant. The incredible, what? Ant Man and the Hulk all combined, and Superman or Spider Man or whatever combined into one. And you had. Uh, you have Hawkeye in the Marvel comics. You got Arjun who could hit a fish uh, by looking at its reflection and the fish is spinning on a disc on top. He has to look into its reflection and without looking at the target, he's able to hit. So you have great archers and they say that Eklavya was even greater than him. That's another story and... Uh, Maybe when they're a little older, they can learn more about Eklavya and Karn and uh, the parallels of uh, these people's lives. But that's a completely different sociological story to talk about. So thank you so much for this. Uh, one last question to both of you. Uh, what kind of challenges you faced while uh, you were writing this book, while you were you know, collecting the data? and everything how it came about so you want to take that right now my challenge challenge is my wi-fi can you hear me yes we yes. can hear you so as long as i'm audible so uh, well <laughs> the, the 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 i think the major challenge i mean what adit was uh, talking about at the end of his um, uh, answer previous answer is what to keep in and what to leave out in terms of a, like, if you have a book that's 200, 300 pages long and mythology, that's like thousands and millions of, you know, whatever years and people and so many crow gods and that's just one faith. Um, I think the biggest challenge really was to try and uh, sift through all the information, all the research and decide on what we would actually put into the book. Now that was guided, of course, by the fact that we were targeting it to a certain age group. So it was uh, like an eight-year-old can also read it, but a 13, 14-year-old can also read it. And so we had to make it age appropriate in that sense. Also, uh, you know, the concepts that you are uh, trying to talk to them about should be some within their awareness scope, uh, something that is easy to, uh, you know, apply to their daily lives. So that was, I think, the, the major challenge. The... Um, Another challenge was, uh, again, that uh, we had to make sure that because our ambition is to uh, portray the multi, 
multiplicity of mythologies of of the niche of the country of the land rather um we should not we should have uh, enough of a focus on even the mythologies that, like aditya and i have not grown up with all these mythologies we are also learning from an outsider's perspective so it becomes very important to be very sensitive to their uh, uh, you know tenets what is sacred what is uh, to be said what is not to be said and then say it in a language which is easy for a child a young reader rather to uh, to accept and uh, really appreciate so so that's one and then of course uh, we are much much older than our readers so to be able to um, i think the very important uh, motivation for us is that we never we never want to talk uh, down to to a child we never want to say that oh we know so much in fact it's the other way around i think we can learn so much so the but but you know to come to adjust your uh, language to a level where uh, we are both on the same wavelength and we are able to you know uh, not crack silly jokes but yet be humorous um and still you know sort of be relevant to a young teenager tween preteen who is uh, you know uh, exposed to so much so many different kinds of uh, writing that was a challenge personally for us because uh, you know we so we had uh, luckily we have two teenagers in the house who our daughter so they read our many drafts and uh, you know they told us where we were going off and they were okay no dad jokes <laughs> no dad jokes or mom jokes <laughs> so um what are the challenges are there uh, uh no i think you encapsulated it first up uh, what uh, to keep and what to leave out uh, either from the point of view of relevance to today's times and uh, also to the uh, you know the whole age appropriateness and uh, be to make it accessible basically a lot of the concepts the way the book is structured it's not a simple like a chronological flow it is a uh, clumps and clusters of different uh, things coming together so to create the parallels and to find and uh, bring in the parallels where required that took a little bit of effort but also to identify the themes that go into every chapter so we have one on twins because it's very important for children to know today you know uh, in uh, medieval ages and possibly a little earlier in india twin children were considered uh, a sign of bad luck especially in uh, ruling families because it suddenly meant who's going to succeed or who uh, who is going to inherit so will one or the other but uh, we learned that there are so many twins that have appeared through our mythological stories some of them you know, divine some of them uh, not divine some of them really evil in fact and some of them created as a, a solution for a particular problem i won't give away more there you have to read the book but uh, yeah so things that children understand so uh, beasts weapons kids are fascinated by some things like this so you have uh, we're talking about a possible with the russia ukraine war everyone has this back uh, end fear that uh, putin might suddenly go off the deep end and press that red button and just send set off nukes and uh, those nuclear missiles can cause the end of the world but thousands of years ago back in uh, the dwapar yug when the pandavas and the kauravas were fighting they had these nuclear weapons or what looked like nuclear weapons because they were capable of destroying the whole world as well and no one used them then and if they tried to use them they suffered greatly for it so the story again a parallel don't try and use these massive weapons because you don't know what they will do you have no idea how much damage they can cause so don't even if you have them don't even think about using them so those kind of connects had to be brought out and uh, hopefully we managed to do that in many ways very true so thank you so much aditya and mudita uh, this session was really insightful uh, we got a lot of uh, lot of you know a lot of clarity 
regarding mythology and I, I'm sure the parents who have attended the session have also felt the same. Thank you for having us and it was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. It's always nice to uh, connect with uh, the people that we are writing for <laughs> and get some good feedback. So we look forward to more sessions and we look forward to hearing from whoever has a question or a suggestion or an idea. We are always we are always happy to talk. Yeah, you can write into us. The email is written there, specific to this project of ours. And we'd like to thank uh, one uh, set of people who uh, we want to thank definitely, apart from Pe the entire Penguin Random House uh, India team, which helped us put this together, is a very, very talented pair of uh, illustrators and artists. They go by the name Doodle Nerve, and uh, they managed to actually bring alive or imagine and create visuals on a scale that we thought was probably not uh, possible. But uh, yeah, they did a fantastic job as well. So thank you, Doodle Nerve. Yes. But uh, the book, by the way, uh, doesn't only have illustrations by Doodle Nerve or what they and we together have imagined, but it also has space uh, for the readers to draw what they imagine. So there's, uh, you know, so because I mean, one person's imagination will be wildly different from another's interpretations are you know so subjective so so the book has a lot of space for in, for the reader to engage for the reader to uh, develop so we really hope that you uh, use it like like you know like it we want thank you to use it <laughs> yeah, yeah. We would like to use it. <laughs> yeah thank you so thank you very much Thank you, Nick.